Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance. So that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee. Be happy in it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Divine Grace, Amen. pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, a lot of times we sit and we talk about the chastisement coming down the pipe because man is being particularly bad and God's going to spank us. And then we also talk about, you know, everyone is so worried about, you know, offending some human being about what they say and what they do and anything like that. But virtually nobody is talking about the fact that with the levels of sin that are going on right now, God is offended by them. So what I want to do is I want to parse out a little bit of stuff because there's some things that people need to understand in relationship to their own sin that is very important um, in order for us to recognize that God does take offense, in, uh, obviously, when we commit sin and what that offense actually looks like. So that's what we, kind of the gist of it. So if you actually look at the definition of glory... It is defined as the manifestation of excellence. So in God, in relationship to God, if, you, if you're looking at his interior life, if you're talking about his interior glory, this is something where if you can see inside of him and see it, you see the manifestation of absolute perfection. And that's his glory, right? His, the glory is this, showing forth and being able to see or being known. The glory is something that makes itself known in some way through this. That's what glory does. It makes itself known, and it's this perfection that makes itself known. So if we can see God's interior state or interior life, we would actually see these, this absolute perfection in every single possible way. This interior glory, human beings have a very specific relationship, or actually all of creation, has a very specific relationship to God. So when you look at creation, we have what's called a non-mutual relationship with God. So that's a very important thing. This is a distinction that St. Thomas came up with in order to explain a very specific problem that was happening in Aristotle's metaphysics. So it's a non-mutual relation. And basically what this means is that all of creation is entirely dependent on God, not just for its creation, but for its continued existence, its preservation of being. And this dependence never changes. So we have this, we have this thing called annihilation. If God were to just retract his causation, the totality of creation could just go out of existence instantaneously. Okay. So this relationship is on, so on this side, the relationship depends upon God. And so in that particular sense, because we depend upon God, this particular aspect of our relationship is, is causal. That is, God causes us to exist, and as a result of that, we depend on him. However, because... Uh, we depend entirely on him and that we cause uh, and that he causes us to exist in relationship to God and creation. This is only what we call a relation of reason. What does this mean? It means that we are not capable of causing anything in God. So there's nothing we do that would change anything that would have to do with his intrinsic or interior glory. Sometimes this is called intrinsic. So there's, and because, whereas on the other hand, he causes all of us, and so everything that he, everything that he just thinks about us, he just has to think that we are a certain way, and boom, we are that way, right? We talked about that in another conference. But this basically means that there's this non-mutual relationship, and it's non-mutual because the causal, the causal, uh, um, uh, the causation is only in one direction, him to us, not us to him. And so when we talk about us having a relationship with God, it's technically speaking, uh, um, uh, it's technically speaking that our dependence upon him 
not anything that we can actually cause in relationship to him. Now, basically what this means is that in relationship to his intrinsic glory, absolutely nothing we do affects his intrinsic glory, nothing. No sin, no good work, nothing causes any change whatsoever in his interior, uh, in his interior glory. So in that respect, he's immune from anything that we actually do. This is why his beatitude, even when he sees all our sin, is completely unchanged. This is actually some, this non-mutual relationship is actually one of the reasons why people have a fundamental misunderstanding about his forgiveness. Because they all say, you know, well, God forgives and forgets. So if I'm contrite and then he forgives me, then he forgets. No, he doesn't change. He, for all eternity, he will see your sin in that particular moment. But he also knows that at this point in your history, you can you entered into, you had contrition, and then he infused grace at that point. It doesn't mean he doesn't stop seeing this sin over here. It just means he sees your current state. And so when you die, he rewards you based upon your current state, not upon the totality of it, if his mercy actually applies. It's not like he forgets this part because he's incapable of that. And there's nothing you can do to cause that change in him, right? So this is a very important point. And by relation of reason, we basically mean that it's, but basically it's not a real relationship. And by real, we mean it's not causal in any way in the sense that we can't cause anything in him. Everything is one way in that respect, okay? But then that means because God, the, all, the totality of creation depends upon God, that means that uh, it's based upon a couple of principles that has to do with the nature of creation. So, the first is that good is diffusive of itself. That's one of the principles, which basically means that something that is good tends to kind of diffuse itself or replicate itself outside of itself. And that's what we tend to kind of generally see. And so, this is, uh, so God, he had a choice, obviously, and he's infinitely good. He had a choice to create or not. But when he made the choice, then he allowed this principle to become full in effect in the creation so that he manifests the intrinsic glory becomes manifest externally to him in his extrinsic glory. What does that mean? Well, in addition to the good being diffusive of itself, the corollary to that is that the cause is always some way in the effect. So that means that God, who is absolute perfection, goodness, and being, every single time he causes a thing, like in creation, it means that, first of all, it starts existing. Because God is existence itself, and since the cause is always some way in the effect, every single time God gets involved with anything, existence is the effect. It, something starts existing. The second is that it's good, because God's not capable of causing something that's evil. And third, that it's perfect on the side of the cause. Now, there can be ancillary causes, or uh, there can be secondary causes which block, or which he allows to block the effect in creation. But when he first made the creation, when he first created everything that existed, this manifestation of his extrinsic glory was perfect. God's causation is perfect. Now, this is a very important point because it basically means this. This is one of the fundamental reasons why evolution is untenable. Because essentially what evolution says is that the creation of God was not perfect. It was not intricately good when he created it. God is always on his part, not necessarily on the side of the effect and creation because there can be, as I said, these secondary causes which block it. But on the side of God, every single thing he causes is intrinsically good in itself. Okay, it's a rather long way of basically saying what? That he wanted to manifest his interior glory extrinsically through his creation. And this extrinsic glory means that the creation was full of goodness. That's why you see in scripture, he looked back and saw that it was good. Well, if everything's dying and killing each other in order to eat each other, in order to do this, that, and the other thing, and death is an integral part of that, how is that good? Um, which basically means they really don't believe in Scripture, which is clearly the case. But 
but then also there's a perfection, okay, in the stuff that he causes in his extrinsic glory. In a sense, what he wanted to do is, because he is goodness itself, he wanted to be able to see himself outside of himself. So when he created, he, he created this kind of like this manifestation of excellence or this image or mere image of him in some way. So one time, I, this, uh, when I had Beelzebub on the ropes one time, I said, you know, it must be pretty brutal for you because everywhere you look, you see him, don't you? And he said, yes, and that's why I want to destroy everything. So the point being is, is that when he creates these things, it's a manifestation of his intrinsic glory. So this extrinsic glory is the manifestation. And so that, that if you look in creation, there's bits and pieces and facets of it that give us a sense to know what God is like. This is actually why we can have proof for God's existence. You can actually argue to God's attributes based on what you see in creation and how these things function. St. Thomas makes it clear, however, that the, the, um, the three persons of the Trinity, whenever they act externally, always act as a unified cause. And so we can't, uh, he said, it's not uh, the physical extrinsic glory, the, phys uh, the creation isn't sufficient to know that he's triune. There can be vestiges of it and that type of thing, but it's not enough to actually know it. Whereas we can know that God is omnipotent. Because to go from nothing to something is an infinite gap. And so the, only God can bridge that gap. Okay, so there's certain, so we know he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, uh, etc. because we can actually see that there is order and everything in this and that the order, at least in the initial creation, was absolutely perfect. So there's a semblance of that there is no limitation on his knowledge. As I was mentioning uh, the other night at the dinner table, you know, everybody likes to think that they're really smart and that they, they actually know a lot of stuff. And we don't know, hardly know anything. So if you, if you think about it, God actually knows at this very moment the actual location of every single electron in the entire universe at all times. He knows it at all times. We don't know any of it, right? So, okay, that all being said, this manifestation of his extrinsic glory means that he created this because he wanted to see himself outside of that. And so when he created it, because he is the cause of it, it's his property. He owns the creation. It belongs to him, not to any creature. That means that if you do anything to detract from this extrinsic glory, then it's a form of theft. You're essentially taking something from him and you have an obligation to pay it back. Now, I want to unpack that a little bit because this is one of the areas, I was going to write an article, but I just decided to cover it today so that I don't have to take the time to write an article, although I might do that too. Um, if you look, Christ said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Obviously, what he's doing is, look, you have to strive for perfection so that you can manifest God's extrinsic glory and fulfill <clears throat> what he wants in creation, right? And we know that every time we commit a sin, we detract from this extrinsic glory because it's disordered. It causes a, lo it causes a loss of goodness or a loss of being, a loss of perfection in some manner every time we commit a sin, but one of the things that most people, Christ said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, this is a divine precept. As part of the divine positive law, you are obligated to do so. You are obligated to strive for perfection. You may not fully reach it, but you have an obligation to continue striving towards that perfection. That means, for example, if I have a defect, there's actually two kinds of defects. If I have a defect for which I have been the cause... I'm the cause of the thing, then that's usually that defect is caused because of some sin, normally speaking. I mean, there can be some that are caused just by ignorance. But the point being is, is that I've caused something, and so I have an obligation, because I've detracted from his extrinsic glory, I have an obligation to, to repair the damage that I've caused. It's part of retributive justice. I've always found it interesting, I've mentioned this before in conferences, that millennials will come up to you, right, and they'll borrow a tool of yours. And then when they bring it back, it's completely trashed. 
And then they'll just hand it to you and say, sorry, and then just walk off. No, sorry doesn't do it. See, what most people don't seem to realize is that in sin, there's two components. There's the sin itself, which is the disorder in the will. That I choose, which is choices in the will, I choose to engage in something that is contrary to God's extrinsic glory, that's contrary to the good. Okay. But then there's also the effects of sin. And so these effects are disorders. If I choose to lie, it leaves a residual habit, an initial habit at least, if not increasing a habit that's already there. It leaves a habit in my lower faculties, inclining them to see things and make the false associations or to present them or to be inclined towards falsity. It also leaves a disorder in my will towards that, malice in relationship to it, and it can also even cause blindness of the intellect. So that over the course of time, if I keep lying, eventually I get to the point where I can't even, I don't even know what the truth is. I think we're seeing certain politicians like that, right? Okay. So there's a certain effects that naturally flow from an action. Now, this is very, from a particular kind of a sin. So if I lie, it means my lower faculties are disordered. So even if I go and I, I'm absolved in confession, God forgives my sin, the sin which is in the will, is forgiven, which basically means what? That God, is, God has absolved the legal binding uh, for me uh, in relationship to that, that I'm no longer subject to having violated the law, is essentially what it means, okay? So he forgives basically the debt that I owed in his extrinsic glory in relationship to this thing. However, there's still the effects, the disordered effects. So even if I get absolution in confession, I still have to overcome the effects. This is why the church has over and over and over again until recently, of course, talked about what they call the temporal punishment due to sin. And the temporal punishment due to sin is what? It's twofold. It's one, I now, my faculties are disordered. And that means that I have, to, I have to, because Christ said, be perfect. Plus, we have a natural inclination. It's part of the third category of natural inclination. We have a natural inclination for, to be perfect. And so it's part of the natural law. It's part of the divine positive law. And that means that I have an obligation to start doing whatever I can to straighten out the effects internal to me that are disordered. And then I also have the obligation because of the, um, I've detracted from his exterior glory. So for example, if I yell at my kid and then he ends up kind of dysfunctional, then I have an obligation to help the kid get straightened out. So this is something extrinsic. I have the obligation to, to deal with that. Now, if it gets to the point where I can't do much, I still have to do, uh, make reparation for it in some manner in relationship to God. St. Thomas says there's two orders of justice. There's the natural order of justice. Now, the natural order of justice, if I steal 50 cents from somebody, I have to give that person 50 cents back. But if the person dies and I steal handing this, I still don't have a right to the 50 cents. And I still have to right this disorder that I've introduced into God's creation and detracted from his external glory. And so as a result, I have an obligation to give that 50 cents to the chair, to poor, or what have you. But that's the way that it actually works. Okay. So these effects, the temporal punishment due to sin is the defects internally in our faculties and then the external defects that I introduce into God's creation as a result of my sin. I've stolen from him by doing that. I've detracted. It's his property. Even I'm his property. I have no right whatsoever to choose sin because it, I belong to him and he is perfection and he's told us this is what we have to do, etc. Um, through the natural law and the divine positive law. And as a result, I have an obligation that if there's any defect in me to start taking reasonable means to overcome it. Why is this so important? Well, it's important because of this. I'm not sure if I'll edit this out. I might leave it in after what my archbishop keeps. He's, <laughs> he's saying a lot of stuff, so hopefully it'll take some of the heat off of me. <laughs> People have this idea. So the church came out in a document 
and it said the, inclina- the, the homosexual orientation is not sinful. No, no, you have to understand exactly what they're saying. They said the homosexual orientation is not sinful. It's acting on the homosexual orientation that's sinful. Now, what they basically mean is that the sin is here in the will. That's what that distinction is absolutely true. But they left out a big part of the story. The big part of the story is that if I have a defect, then I have an obligation. So if, if a guy is, has a homosexual orientation, if he says, well, if I, if I'm, if I have these, you know, the, uh, uh, gay orientation, as long as they don't act that, I'm, I'm okay. That's not true. What the truth is, you have an obligation to start working to remove that defect because just the orientation itself detracts from God's extrinsic glory. Just that disorder itself. It doesn't matter if you're the cause of the thing or not. It doesn't matter. Because it's, it's basically similar to this. You know, I tell people, look, it, if you have a kid and he's one years old and he soils his diaper, you are in no position to stand there and say, well, I didn't soil the diaper. I don't have to clean it up. It's not as long as, you know, as long as I don't do that, then I'm okay. That's not true. We have an obligation to clean up other people's messes under certain circumstances. So even if, so when I mention these defects, we can cause them ourselves to our own sin, but then also they can have defects that are caused by others in us. So for example, when parents give the wrong formation or bad formation to their children, because the children, if, because the children are now responsible for themselves, which is we know from the third category of natural inclination, because they're responsible for themselves, they have to begin the process of cleaning it up. This was the biggest problem with the hippie generation who come in through, oh, it was my parents. Okay, let's just say, so it's all my parents' fault that I'm like this. No, it's your fault you're like this. It may be the case that your parents did something to cause this in you or some other individual did this to cause in you. It does not mean that it's not your obligation to clean it up. You're a mess and you have to clean it up. Because why? The divine precept of divine positive law precept, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He's not talking about just in the will. We're talking about in all our faculties. Our obligation is to slowly fashion our faculties to get them in perfect congruity with right reason, illumined by faith, uh, basically, which is reorienting them to the beatific vision so that if the beatific vision were to occur, those faculties could would be rightly ordered in relationship to it. And if you don't do it now, that's why the church has the doctrine on purgatory. You have to get these things cleaned up before you're going to do that, right? Okay, so that being the case, and this is what I tell people, look, if you, if you suffer from a homosexual orientation, I get it, you may not be the actual cause of it. I mean, they know the cause of it, they know what causes it, it's not the human genome, it's not born this way, etc. But And we understand, psychologists know, they all, so when they say we don't know, they're not telling the truth. They actually do know what causes homo, the homosexual orientation. But it, and so it's something that's actually, uh, it's a dissociative disorder, which can happen as early as 10 months of age, okay? So that being the case, that's why people say I was always gay. No, actually, you weren't always this way. It just happened before your first memory, right? Okay, so the point being is, is that the, uh, you might not have been the cause of this problem. It doesn't mean that it's not your obligation to clean it up. Because if you don't clean it up, then you become complicit in the existence of that defect in you, and that's sinful. Mm -hmm. This is something people don't seem to get, is the fact, and this is what I tell homosexuals, they'll say, well, being, having a homosexual orientation isn't sinful. Well, now, wait a minute. It depends. If you're talking about you, you didn't cause it, and you've always fought against it, and you've taken reasonable means against it, that's absolutely true. There's no culpability on your part, and God is not going to uh, punish you uh, for having not overcome this thing as long as you've taken reasonable means. On the other hand, if you haven't taken any reasonable means to clean up this thing, you're complicit in this thing being there, 
and therefore you're willing to, you're willing, basically, let's put it this way, you're willing to allow the detraction from his extrinsic glory to continue without trying to take reasonable means to clean it up. And as a result, you're culpable for it. It's called a culpable defect, right? And so it doesn't matter that someone else caused it. You have an obligation to clean it up, right? And I don't think it's at all helpful that we have certain prelates in the church running around saying things like, you know, it's okay to be gay and gay marriage is true marriage. And that's not helpful at all to them because it's a disorder. And it confirms them in maintaining this uh, detraction from God's extrinsic glory. So there are certain defects. It, you might not be culpable for it first getting there, but you may become culpable if you don't take reasonable means once you realize, oh, I got to deal with this and I have to uh, take reasonable means in order to overcome it, right? And you, and you don't do that, then, then that's culpable, okay? And it's sinful, by the way, as I mentioned, and the degree of sin is based upon the degree of the defect. If the defect inclines you towards something gravely disordered and you don't do anything about it, that's grave matter. Whereas if you, if it's just something venial sin, like you, you tend to, people call you on the phone, you find them annoying, and then you just do little white lies here, and okay, that's venial, but you have to stop that, right? And so if you, and you have an obligation to start working on your faculties in order to come to overcome that. But there's also another reason as part of it is, is because as long as you have this defect, it means there's a weakness there and a tendency towards something that's sinful and you run the risk of offending God in the future through sin. And this is, and this is why we have, a, we, have to, we have to do everything we can to make sure that we don't offend him. It's just part of, um, it's just part of actual piety that we don't want to offend him, right? Okay. So when I started to talk out about how this is, uh, it's a lot of information, but I want to talk about this thing in extrinsic glory. There's absolutely nothing we can do to offend God in relationship to his intrinsic glory. There's nothing we can do in that, right? Because we can't cause it. We can't affect it. All that we can affect is the manifestation of his glory in his, in, in his extrinsic glory. And because this belongs to him, Every time we detract from it, he's offended. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it basically mean to be, offense, or be offended? It means you've suffered some form of injury. That's what that means. So when people say, well, I'm offended that you use that word. Oh, shut up. You're not offended at all. Offended would be as if I said something and somehow or another it caused trauma to you, or it ended up causing you to lose your job or something like that, right? And so just the fact that you have a negative emotion from something doesn't necessarily mean it's offensive in itself. It means you've got a problem on your part, is what it also can mean, okay? I'm not suggesting that you can't say things that are offensive to people, that's not what I'm saying, because it, but it's ultimately about modesty, etc., decorum specifically. But getting back to this, it basically means that in relationship to his extrinsic glory, each time we commit a sin, we detract from his extrinsic glory and we offend him because we cause injury to his extrinsic glory every mm -hmm. time we sin. This is why we have to make reparation. We have to make up for it to the degree that we can. Now, St. Thomas says that there are certain things for which we cannot make reparation because there's such that... And there's no way as a human being I can restore them. So, for example, if I was to kill somebody, I can't restore the person to life and restore the thing. But I can either give my own life and be, be willing to be subject to capital punishment if I, you know, if there was, if I was volitionally did so. But, or, but I can, oh, but I, there's other things that I can actually do in order to make up. Another one would be things like rape, child mis molestation. There's certain forms of damage that they cause to people that cannot be repaired. So St. Thomas just says, you know, you can make up to the degree that you can, which you have an obligation to do. So we have an obligation to uh, do as much as we can to restore his extrinsic glory to the degree that we can. But there might be some times that we've basically taken away from his extrinsic glory. This is actually one of the effects of the passion. 
One of the reasons Christ went through all the effects of the passion is so that, as he said, I, I will make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. What's going to happen is he's going to restore on his part, because we're not capable, the fullness of the extrinsic glory, at least in a part of his creation, not the totality of it, because those in hell are never, never going to, they're going to be constantly, um, the, his, his extrinsic glory there is being manifest in justice, even though it would, it would have been better had they not done that, obviously. Okay. The point being is, is he's offended every single time we commit a sin. Now, here's the other component to this. And so every, he's the one that's taking all this offense. But here's one of the other things. It's not just in the sins, uh, the, uh, the subjective sins or the formal sins that I commit. That is, in the sense of, it's not just that I volitionally understood or intentionally or I intellectually understood what was going on and then I volitionally chose to do it, it's not just in those sins that he takes offense, but he also takes offense in even just objective sin. Why? Because even with objective sin, so if a person doesn't know that something's sinful and they keep doing it, that does not change the reality, that their ignorance about what's going on does not change the reality that in God's creation, his extrinsic glory is being subtracted every single time that happens. This is one of the reasons why the saints used to say that if you realize that you've been offending God and all these things, even though there might not have been any sin, you should do reparation to make up for it because he was offended every single time this happens. So even if people think, uh, you know, uh, basically what I'm saying is, objective sin also detracts from his extrinsic glory and is also offensive to him. Obviously, it's not as offensive as when we do it volitionally, that is, formally, and it's, it's formal sin involved, but it still detracts from it. And so every single time there's objective sin that's occurring, God, is his extrinsic glory is also being... Th this is one of the reasons why you will see in the history of the world, there are times, which I hope to make another um, uh, podcast on this later, but if you look at this, there are times he's punished particular people. Now, you, particular groups of people are regions or locations. And usually it's because, I mean, we see this in Sodom and Gomorrah, etc. So we know that there are certain places he just wipes out because of, the, uh, because of how offensive it's become to him. And he's only going to sustain a certain detraction, a certain amount of detraction from his intrinsic glory before he pulls the plug on it. Why? Because the whole reason he created the world was to manifest his goodness externally to it, and you're taking from it, so eventually he's just going to say, hey, that's enough. Mm -hmm. right? This is why he created us. Okay. okay. So, well, the, if you look at it, let's just say for the sake of argument, that worldwide... I think there's what seven and a half billion people now seven billion okay about eight yeah i think it's about eight. so let's just say for the sake of argument that everybody on the planet only committed one venial sin a day that means that god is offended his extrinsic glory is detracted from eight billion times a day just on a venial level not even the mortal level and it, the point being is is that it, at a certain point that the detraction from his extrinsic glory becomes so great that he has to have a great reset, so to speak. He's got to clean up the situation in order to get people back to where they need to be, if for no other reason than for their sake, in seeing it. But I think that in my concern is, is that we spend all our time listening to people say, well, I'm offended by that, and I'm offended by this, and I'm offended by that. That video by J.P. Sears, where he, it just goes around the table, I'm offended that you're offended, and I'm offended that this is offended, and that's, by the time, and he's just obviously making, making out how ridiculous it all is. But the point being is, is that um, we all keep, what's happened is because human beings have become so self-absorbed and because of the principle of imminence, and where everything is self-referential, Virtually nobody, you rarely, rarely hear any homilies on reparation. You rarely hear about God being offended by all the things that are actually occurring. 
You rarely hear priests talking about the obligation to restore the extrinsic glory that you detracted from. You never hear them talk about if you have a defect, even if you don't act on it, you have an obligation to clean it up. You never hear that. And so the point being is, is that I'm very concerned at the fact that there's all this offense over and over and over again that's being meted out against God and nobody's talking about it. Nobody's even focusing on it. Nobody's paying any attention to it. So it's analogous to the kid who, you know, you get the, the one or two, well, he's back about one and a half, and he just starts bawling and he's wiggling around and screaming and he's not even paying attention to the fact that he's whacking you in the face with his, you know, with his elbows or whatever. He's not paying any attention because he's only focused in on his emotion at the time. And it, we're, all, we're basically like that at this stage. And so people have to be, there's two things that I think people have to keep in mind. You have an obligation to restore the extrinsic glory. So you have an obligation to not just get to confession, but then start the process of making restitution for all this distraction that you've made from his extrinsic glory, which is basically through things like plenary indulgences and things of that sort. Um, doing indulgence, doing indulgence work, but also do, just doing works to make restitution or reparation. But then the other part of it is too is, is that charity is such that if you love somebody, so love is the type of thing that if you really love somebody, you see this playing itself out in human psychology over and over and over again. If, there, if a person has a real deep love for somebody and someone else comes up and offends them, our love for that person is such that we don't want to see the person who we know is that good suffer underneath or to sorrow at being treated in that manner or being taken away or you know being offended in that manner, suffering that injury. And so when we see if we, they do suffer an injury, you'll actually see this like with husbands. If something happens to the wife, what do they do? They go to her, even though they might not have been the cause, they'll go to her and try and do what, they'll say things and do things in order to mitigate the injury that she's suffering under, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is exactly the same attitude we should have towards God. He is being offended gravely billions of times a day all over the planet, over and over and over again. And the detraction from his extrinsic glory has become guarded Gantuan, to such a point that even we've become an abomination to ourselves in the things that we're actually doing. And so as a result of that, if we really, if we really truly loved God, we would be looking at him and thinking to ourselves how we would, we would suffer the pain that would like the husband in relationship with the wife of seeing his wife injured. He would, we would see that same thing. We'd have that same disposition in relationship to God when we see how evil the world has become and that we would want to start making it up to him and become as holy as possible so that, that at least there's something pleasing in this life and so that his extrinsic glory is somehow manifest in, in, in the world. I mean, it's always going to be manifest to some degree just by the fact that creation itself manifests it in his governance of the materially created universe. But the point being is, is that we should really be making reparation for these things, even if we're not the cause. Because of the fact that we don't, and we don't want to see God offended that much. If we really loved him, it would hurt us to see how much he's offended. And, and, but there's also a certain component, there's a certain flip side to that too, which is when God, uh, so for example, when the, when the husband goes to the wife, and he does whatever he can to mitigate the injury or to help undo the injury. The normal attitude of the wife is to see that the husband is willing her good and therefore he loves her. And her natural response is to love him back in a deeper fashion. Right? It's the same thing with God. If we make reparation to God, he sees that we're trying to keep these things from happening so that he doesn't suffer this loss in relationship to his extrinsic glory. That because we love him, we... We, we, because he is so good and we love him that we want to see his extrinsic glory fully manifest, right? And as a result, when he sees us trying to make that reparation, his natural response is going to be, although you can't really say that in a strict sense of relationship to God, but his response is going to be to love us more by making the reparation. 
But this offense is something that we have to really be taking, you know, taking seriously. So, any questions? War. <clears throat> it, uh, we live in an era where, the, you know, every single generation, if you look at history, I like military warfare, and if you observe it, every generation of humanity, there was a war. Yeah. And we have none of that. Not as it once was. We have war, but it's very minor compared to something great as it once was. And what, in, in some way, war brought out, you know, chivalry, masculinity, authentic, right. and, 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 of course, countries that were Catholic, and countries right. that were, even if it wasn't a justified war, there was something, however, that it kept humanity from becoming extraordinarily gay, transgender, and anything that you see is Yeah, I mean, so when you're fighting for survival, the last thing you're going to be worrying about is your orientation. Yeah, but also there was faith, family, and culture these people fought for, even if the right. leader was not moral. Right. But uh, in some way, it brought out... Uh, I don't know. The, the world was not so... It is. I think, though, that what... I mean, this is my, purely my own speculation and opinion, but I think the reason why there's been kind of a cessation of any major war, there have been wars, but any major war is because he's waiting for us because... Well, let me back up. One of the things that has become clear to me is that if you look at the 1950s and all the moral perversity and depravity that was underneath the veneer of respectability and decency, because that was the generation where all the pedophiles and homosexuals got into the seminary, and that was the generation that started fornication in, your, in earnest, and that was the generation, you go down the whole list, right? That was the generation that once they got in power literally destroyed the church, right? Okay, so there was obviously something perverse and wicked about that generation. But I think that what's clear to me is, is that God retracted his grace at a certain point. And I think I know why. I'm not going to speculate about it. Uh, I, the point being is, is that I think that he's allowed the cessation of war to set us up for a bigger spanking. Interesting. So I think that what's coming down the pike is going to make all of that look like child's play. I can't remember where Our Lady said it. Well, who said it, frankly? And I think it was Our Lady who said that the coming chastisement will be all it will be almost as great as the deluge or greater than the deluge I can't remember exactly how she says it and so we're we're looking at we're looking at a severe spanking and I think we're just in that lull he's setting this up you can see it just by what our politicians are doing and all the treason that you see in our politicians the fact that well the spiritual chastisement always is, a, is always a precursor to the physical chastisement and we're seeing that in the church I mean we have large numbers of bishops and cardinals running around saying that the gay lifestyle is perfectly fine. So this is, this is a punishment that's coming down the pike. Um, and I think there's other things that are coming down the pike that are going to make living a Catholic life from within the church even more difficult. So the point, I guess the point being is, is that um, in the past, wars were usually a sufficient correction for people because they had sufficient virtue. I mean, the... War is the effect of sin. That's clear from Scripture, and it's also clear from... Uh, Fulton Sheen has a book called Whence Comes Wars. So it's very clear that God allows wars because there's a sin problem. But usually people haven't descended to our level of depravity, which is why even if there's a horrific war, I'm not so sure people will get their act together. So... Yes? How, how uh, is... Yeah. Uh, how uh, how do we interior? What how do you? Uh, what are we to do? Are we to just say, oh well, it's just what it is, you know? Or how, what is our um, need for peace of mind right. to try to live our daily duty as a normal human being in a crazy world? How do, well, there's two parts to it. One is I do have two conferences, one on passive scandal and one on active scandal, and that basically it doesn't matter what people do, it should have absolutely no impact on our interior life or our faith specifically. Um, part of it is too is, is to realize what God is showing us right now is this is what humanity becomes when there's no grace. This is, this is what we are. This is what we descend to. And so we just have to realize, okay, 
this is humanity laboring under original and actual sin. And this is if God doesn't kind of keep us, sustain us and keep us floating and, and uh, rather than just letting us sink. There's that element. But the real thing, and this is something that I'm not going to mention his name, but there was a cardinal that I was around about, um, oh, I would say about nine months ago. And you could tell he had a deep love for the church and the fact that it was so bad in the church, you could see weighed on him. He was willing to suffer. In other words, it, but what it made me realize is that he has a true love. If we have a true love for the church and a true love for um, God, etc., cetera, um, we have to be willing to suffer the emotional pain of these things if for no other reason to keep ourselves rightly ordered. So we have to be willing to embrace our cross, but it also means that what really should be paining us is not the fact that we don't have people in the church who are confirming us in the church and its teachings and helping us to lead holy lives. That shouldn't necessarily be the primary thing that hurts us, although it should, that, that should be something that pains us. What should be pained is how God is suff is suffering injury in his extrinsic glory in all this. He's the one that is primarily the one that suffers the primary injustice, the primary injury. Mm -hmm. And so there should be, um, if we love him as much as we really should, it's like I said in relationship to the husband of his wife, if something happens to his wife, it's painful for him to first recognize it and see it. And so once he does it, so he embraces the, the reality of that, and then he does what he can to mitigate it. And that's what we should be doing. So our interior disposition should be really one of willing to suffer whatever he wants to send our way, but at the same time to be willing to, um, to do whatever we can to mitigate uh, his loss of extrinsic glory, to make reparation for it. I have a question. Is there, a, <clears throat> is there like a hierarchy of efficacy in regards to doing acts of reparation? So for instance, you know, I, I do reparations for, you know, my own sins and for the sins of my family, which I'm responsible, you know, for them. Uh, if I step outside of that and I do acts of reparation for sins that I know of right. outside of my own responsibility, is there a, is there a, a, a lesser efficacy there? Uh, you know, is it a better thing to say, to challenge somebody and say, hey, you should really be doing reparation for this um, because my reparation is less efficacious? Um, uh, yes, there is. Part of it is based on the principle of proximity. So we have a primary obligation um, to uh, make reparation in relationship to those for ourselves and for those who are proximate to us and then as we go out. Um, but then, of course, there is, if a person has gotten to the point where they've overcome most of their own defects and they're still kind of chiseling away at it, etc., sometimes, you know, super regulatory is what they used to say, it, is that you would actually kind of go a bit above beyond what you're obligated to do and just do a reparation for other people. Now, there's a distinction, though, that needs to be made. The reparation that you make for, say, someone who's not as proximate is less likely to have an impact or to restore that aspect of the extrinsic glory because of its remoteness. However, it doesn't mean, though, that your own interior advance in holiness is less. But you want, you, the main thing you want to do is make reparation for your own sins and the sins of your own family. And, which actually brings up a point. The, the principal way we make reparation is, that, so this is, the, this is the structure. The primary may, way you make reparation is you go to confession and get the sin absolved so that there's no legal, there's nothing legally between you and God that would keep you apart from each other. Then the next one is, is correcting your own faculties. That's your next form of reparation. Right, because that's what you're going to spend time in purgatory for, or and then after that, what external things that you've actually caused, and then to other people in our family, etc. So it goes down the chain. But in purgatory, you have to make up. Um, if you have any venial sin, you've got to be purged of that. But it's also, but it's primarily the interior, um, uh, our defects, our personal defects, and what we didn't clean up in our own lives. So if we really work on those then what will happen is, is that, and it, just by doing that, we're also doing a good act, which means if we're in the state of grace, we can actually be meriting a higher place in heaven, etc., or at least restoring the place of heaven we should have had. Um, and then so, but at the same time, it's, we're, we're correcting the primary things, and that's where we're going to see 
the most effect of our actions. Well, um, I, I don't know, like certain people that come into your life and they're loaded with problems and somehow, you know, they take interest in you. I've had this before and they just, uh, you know, and, and then you ask yourself, did God send them in my life for a reason for me to try and draw them to him? Or just because of how bad they were, I kind of had a tendency to just kind of ward myself off and just say, well, you know, okay, I'm good. <laughs> but not really get involved and try. But then I think, well, maybe I should have given more time to that person. So maybe I should have done this, or maybe. I, I don't know. Well, I'm I think not a priest that, or not a psychiatric, you know, I think. That's well, there's two parts to it. One is, uh, we always, they always say, tend your own foxhole first. Yeah, that's how I Yeah, think. fight your own battles yeah. first, mm -hmm. and then you can help other people fight their battles, but even those aren't there. Some people you can, you're, you're capable of helping them fight their battles, and those people, their battles are just too big, and you better, be, you better yeah. bail. They usually have huge, and think, oh, I don't Yeah, <laughs> you've seen people more and more... Um, you're seeing people more and more just with gargantuan problems. I mean, just huge. The other thing is, is that, um, I'll mention this now, since it, it's kind of here, one of the effects of sin, one of the temporal punishments due to sin is empowering demons in your life or in the lives of, the wor in the lives of others and in the world. So every time you commit a sin, you're letting them in, right? And... Um, one of the things that uh, we, we have to realize is that a lot of times just doing basic elementary spiritual battle, you know, beating them up and booting them out and keeping them at bay is itself a form of reparation. Hmm. Because you're getting them out of his creation, that is the material creation, and so God's extrinsic glory is going to be restored to some degree. And that's one element of reparation that a lot of people tend not to make, I think. <laughs> how, the, um, how does the, the lack of honoring the Blessed Mother or like the Protestants or all these religions that don't you know, really you know, recognize her for who she is? I mean, how does that fit into this offended God as far as this you know, the external glory and that kind of thing? Is it just kind of a more special case? To kind of in the sense that um, Our Lady's part of creation and she is uh, probably, she, not probably, she, other than Christ's humanity, she is the greatest manifestation of his extrinsic glory. Oh, okay. And That's so, right, and there's different facets to her. So because, because she has so many different perfections, that's why she has so many different titles and why God wants to draw attention to her under a variety of different aspects as Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Virgin Most Prudent, or you know, help of Christians or whatever. She's, he's, there's a variety of different perfections that she has and he wants to draw attention to those. And people who detract against that or do those kinds of things, that God is offended by that. So. Okay. If you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et fili et spiritus super vos et semper. Amen.